There is a place which is located at the crossroads of three continents, forming one of the most important sea routes in the world, a place where three great religions were born, where many ethnic movements originated, a place where great civilizations flourished and in some cases perished. A place which has almost always been at the center of strategic interest, geopolitical reflections, since it is considered a focal point of global, economic and strategic concern. There is a place called home, the Mediterranean. The Eastern Mediterranean presents a record high of unique characteristics, nowhere to be found around the world but in this neighborhood of the globe. The carved images on the early Minoan sealstones are tantalizing, impenetrable. The biblical narratives present an extraordinary journey into the region. The pyramids are magnificent masterpieces, mysteriously scattered around. Byblos is considered to be the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. The Achaeans made a colossal journey from Argos, Greece, to Cyprus, the land of copper. Remnants of ancient monuments, cultural exchanges, great civilizations and peoples form a residual power in today's countries surrounding the region. Described as the seedbed and model of human history, the region forms the basis of exchanges in all levels of civilization. The Carthaginian's Tertullian question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem, is not rhetorical anymore. It does not express a conflict between the pagans and monotheists. In light of the prospects available to the region, the semantics of establishing an energy stronghold are well understood by the regional governments today. Since the early historical recordings, the states adjacent to the Mediterranean Sea have been connected to each other in unique ways, forming the cradle of civilizations. The Mediterranean has been called by different names, evidencing its multicultural orientation and mystique. Mare Nostrum for the Romans, Yam Gadol, the Great Sea for the Jews, the Great Green for the Egyptians, Iendos ke kathimas thalata, legomeni, for the ancient Greeks, etc. The Mediterranean has been, in other words, a sea of worlds and the sea of worlds. Distinguished guest, the discovery of a wealth of resources in the seabed and subsoil of the southeastern Mediterranean has been one of the most major developments in the region and might well be the driving force of change, economic growth and prosperity of the countries neighboring the sea. In a release by the United States Geological Survey in August 2010, the survey maintained that an estimated 122 trillion cubic feet of undiscovered, technically recoverable natural gas are in the Levant Basin province, located in the eastern Mediterranean region. It should be emphasized here that the survey did not assess undiscovered oil and gas resources found in neighboring geological formations such as the Tartus Fault, 
the Eratosthenes Sea Mounds and the Nile Delta Cone Province, which bounds the Levant area. Finally, the USGS forming a strong reference point in the Mediterranean energy agenda estimated the presence of 1.7 billion barrels of undiscovered, technically recoverable oil. Such discoveries inform the rhetoric on energy currently in play in the region. The importance of energy resources is paramount in today's world. In relation to the use of natural gas, the energy outlook for the period 2006-2035 for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Europe shows a rise from 19.8 to 23.9 quadrillion BTU with an estimated growth of 0.7% compared to a negative growth of minus 0.2% and minus 0.7% for the use of liquids and coal respectively over the same period, evidencing a major turn from traditional sources to cleaner forms of energy, making natural gas the world's fastest growing fossil fuel. This is due to the fact that there is an increasing demand for natural gas as a source of electric power and use in the industrial sectors, natural gas having a lower carbon intensity compared with oil and coal. Other benefits of using natural gas include its noteworthy lower price to oil, low capital costs for new power generation plants using natural gas as a fuel and favorable thermal efficiencies. Taking into account the above, one needs to be sure about a certain fact. The latest exploration and exploitation for energy resources frontier in the southeastern Mediterranean requires the reader policymakers and the countries surrounding the region to reconsider their strategies and address security issues and concerns on the story narrating the region since ancient times. Ulysses' journey across the Mediterranean following the end of the Trojan War would have not been the same today. Despite the fact that Ithaca, his home island, still remains unmoved. According to an analyst for World Oil magazine, if new discoveries continue to occur in the eastern Mediterranean, it could change the energy equation of Europe and the Middle East. Russia and Qatar will have to make adjustments as a result of the entry of Israel, Cyprus and possibly Lebanon as LNG exporters. In a region that introduces new political and economic variables on a routine basis, the next decades should lead to a complex calculus between the embattled countries. The discoveries of hydrocarbons in the basin presents pressing challenges, immense prospects and promising opportunities. Should the geopolitical implications crystallize, the resources found in the area may drastically modify the energy picture in the wider Mediterranean region, making it one of the most important energy provinces. Distinguished guests, racing to secure their own slice of the energy market, countries in the region have proceeded to establish their exclusive economic zones, delineating them 
in turn, and forming bilateral agreements. Based on the territorial sea law of 1964, the Republic of Cyprus, a member to the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea since 1988, established a territorial sea up to 12 nautical miles and, on account of that, in 1974, Cyprus enacted legislation to the extent that governs the exploration and exploitation of the continental shelf. Cyprus has also proclaimed a contiguous zone. Section 2 of the Continental Shelf Law of 1974 provides for the method of delimitation of Cyprus's continental shelf, namely that the outer boundary of the continental shelf shall, unless otherwise agreed between the Republic and the state whose coasts lie opposite those of the Republic, in no case extend beyond the median line. In a seminal moment, the Republic of Cyprus adopted on 2nd of April 2004 a law to provide for the proclamation of the exclusive economic zone by the Republic of Cyprus, heralding the signing of a series of bilateral agreements with the Arab Republic of Egypt, the State of Israel and Lebanon. The State of Israel is not a party to the 1982 Convention. Israel has proclaimed a territorial sea up to 12 nautical miles in accordance with the territorial waters law as amended and in relation to its continental shelf has adopted legislation in 1953 whereby it stated that the territory of the state of Israel shall include the seafloor and underground of the submarine areas adjacent to the shores of Israel but outside Israeli territorial waters to the extent that the depth of the superjacent water permits the exploitation of the natural resources situated in such areas. On July 2012, the permanent mission of Israel to the United Nations transmitted a communication including the list of geographical coordinates for the delimitation of the northern limit of its territorial sea and exclusive economic zone. In that communication, it is made clear that Israel follows the established customary international law principles relating to maritime law, and despite the fact that Terminal Point 1, which is derived from the agreement between the State of Israel and the Republic of Cyprus, on the delimitation of the exclusive economic zone of 2010 has exactly the same coordinates as point one that identifies the southern terminal point of the agreement between Cyprus and Lebanon. Note one in the communication expressly states in line with the content of the agreement between Israel and Cyprus and Cyprus and Lebanon that the geographical coordinates of point one could be reviewed and or modified as necessary in light of a future agreement regarding the delimitation of the exclusive economic zone to be reached by the three states concerned with respect to such point. In relation to such review and or modification, both the communication and the 2010 agreement between the Republic of Cyprus and the State of Israel make express reference to the principles of customary international law relating to the delimitation of the exclusive economic zones between states. Lebanon is a party to the 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea having signed it on 5th of January 1995. In 1983, Lebanon 
proclaim the 12 nautical miles wide territorial sea and degree number 6433 of 2011 relates to the delineation of the boundaries of the exclusive economic zone of Lebanon. Not surprisingly, as has been the practice in the region where part of the EEZ is disputed, Article 3 of Degree Number 6433 provides that the borders of Lebanon's EEZ may be refined and improved in the light of negotiations with the relevant neighboring states. It is finally noted that Lebanon has not signed any maritime boundary delimitation agreements with neighboring countries, with the exception of the 2007 agreement between Cyprus, which although been ratified by the Republic, it has not been ratified by Lebanon, but has proceeded with unilateral declarations as to her exclusive economic zone. Egypt became a party to UNCLOS on 16 of August 1983. Egypt also proclaimed in 1951 a 12 nautical miles territorial sea. A presidential decision of 1958 deals with Egypt's continental shelf, establishing a system of measurements of maritime zones based on straight baselines. Egypt has also signed in 2003 an agreement with Cyprus delimiting the exclusive economic zones of the two countries affected by the median line of which every point is equidistant from the nearest point on the baseline of the two parties. A quick reference ought to be made in relation to two other countries in the Eastern Mediterranean, Syria and Turkey. Syria has not entered into any maritime boundary delimitation agreements with any other state in the region and has repealed in 2003 a legislation that proclaimed a 35 nautical miles territorial sea. The 2003 legislation establishes an exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles, albeit the fact that the said law does not give any specifications about its delimitations. The current crisis in Syria is unlikely to allow for any developments as regards issues of delimitation and energy until its conclusion. Turkey is not a party to the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and has not entered into any maritime boundary delimitation agreements in the Mediterranean region, although Turkey has signed similar agreements in the Black Sea. All of these agreements have been signed on the basis of the principle of the median line and all equitable principles. Turkey does not recognize the government of Cyprus and has made a number of false assertions and arbitrary claims in relation to Cyprus. Undoubtedly, the above examination of issues relating to delimitation and, secu and security concerns pertinent to the region demands a holistic, thorough study of the law of the sea relating to the delineation of the different maritime jurisdiction zones. In particular, the relevant provisions of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea should be examined in the prism of the particular circumstances existing in the Mediterranean. Part 2 of the Convention deals 
with the notion of the territorial sea and contiguous zone. The 1982 Convention on the Law of the Sea regulates inter alia the legal status of the territorial sea, of the airspace over the territorial sea, and of its bed and subsoil, as well as regulating the rights and duties of coastal and third states in the contiguous zone adjacent to the territorial sea. Both in the internal waters and in the territorial sea, coastal states exercise a full range of sovereignty, jurisdiction and control. Measuring the breadth of territorial sea from a system of baselines regulated by both Canada's national law and the 1982 convention, internal waters are dealt with in Article 8 of the Convention. In such waters, defined as those that fall in the landward sites of the baselines, the coastal state has full sovereignty and jurisdiction, both prescriptive and enforcement, as if they were part of its land territory. Additionally, the right of innocent passage constituting a fundamental right pertained to third states does not apply within the internal waters of a coastal state. As the 1982 Convention is silent as to whether foreign ships have right of access to a port which falls within the area of the internal waters, state practice evidences that the ports of every state should, in principle, be open to foreign merchant vessels and can only be closed when the vital interests of the state so require. Despite the fact that the Aramco arbitration held that such right exists in customary international law, it is clear that any such right would be subject to substantial restrictions. The regime of the territorial waters is governed extensively by the 1982 Convention. According to the Convention, every state has the right to establish the breadth of the territorial sea up to a limit not exceeding 12 nautical miles. It is noted here that all states concerned in the Eastern Mediterranean have established a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles. Greece and Turkey established a six nautical miles territorial sea in the Aegean Sea, whereas Turkey has established a 12 nautical miles territorial sea in its Black Sea and Mediterranean Sea coast. In the territorial waters, coastal states enjoy sovereignty, which extends to the airspace over the territorial sea, as well as to its beds and subsoil. In such waters, which encompass an area of considerable security sensitivity for coastal states, the extent of coastal state sovereignty and jurisdiction is vast. A foreign ship, for example, performing an innocent passage in the territorial sea of the coastal state must not engage in any threats or use of force against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of the coastal states, or in any other manner which violates the principles of international law found in the United Nations Charter. Furthermore, foreign ships must not exercise or practice with weapons of any kind or perform any act aimed at collecting information to the prejudice of the defense or security of the coastal states. Finally, in relation to passage which is not considered innocent, the carrying out of research or survey activities, interference with any systems of communication 
or any other facilities or installations of the coastal states and other activities not having a direct bearing on, pass on passage are considered to be prejudicial to the peace, good order or security of the coastal state. The coastal state has a duty to not obstruct passage of foreign ships, which is innocent, but at the same time such state is given certain rights of protection, including taking the necessary steps in its territorial sea to prevent passage which is not innocent and suspend temporarily in specified areas of its territorial sea without discrimination in form or in fact among foreign ships, the innocent passage of foreign ships for reasons relating to its security. As regards the exercise of criminal jurisdiction by the coastal state on board a foreign ship performing an innocent passage, Article 27 of the 1982 Convention does not confer such a right on the coastal states in connection with any crime committed on board the foreign ship during its passage except when the consequences of the crime extend to the coastal state or the crime is of a kind to disturb the peace of the country or the good order of the territorial sea or when the assistance of the local authorities has been requested. For outbound foreign ships from internal waters, the coastal state has a right to enforce criminal laws and regulations. In relation to civil jurisdiction of the coastal states on vessels traveling in their territorial sea in accordance with the provisions relating to innocent passage, it should be noted that a vessel cannot be stopped or diverted for the purpose of exercising civil jurisdiction in relation to a person on board the foreign vessel. Nevertheless, for outbound vessels from the internal waters of the coastal state lying in or passing through its territorial sea, the coastal state may levy execution against or arrest for the purpose of any civil proceedings a foreign ship. In addition to the above, the Convention on the Law of the Sea provides for specific rules relating to warships and other government ships operated for non-commercial purposes. Of relevance to issues examined herein, it's Article 30 of the Convention, which deals with issues of non-compliance by warships with the laws and regulations of the coastal states. In such cases, the coastal state may require the vessel involved to leave its territorial sea immediately. International responsibility for any loss or damage to the coastal state resulting from such non-compliance is to be borne by the flag state of the vessel. In addition to the territorial sea, states exercise a certain degree of jurisdiction in a zone contiguous to the, ter to the territorial sea, not extending beyond 24 nautical miles from the baselines. Such jurisdiction relates to the prevention of infringement of the coastal states customs, fiscal, immigration or sanitary laws and regulations within its territory or territorial sea and punishing infringement of the above laws and regulations committed within its territory or territorial sea. Freedom of navigation of foreign vessels is enjoyed by all in the contiguous zone as it overlaps with the exclusive economic zone in which high seas freedoms of navigation apply. Nevertheless, the right of hot pursuit of vessels seeking to flee from their jurisdiction of the coastal states 
following an infringement of its customs, fiscal, immigration, or sanitary laws and regulations, applies in outbound from the contiguous sea vessels. It is noted here that the right of hot pursuit may be undertaken in cases of violations of laws and regulations of the coastal state taking place in its internal waters and territorial sea, and also applies mutatis mutandis to violations in the exclusive economic zone or the continental shelf of the coastal state. Hot pursuit ceases as soon as the ship pursuit enters the territorial sea of its own state or of a third state. In the context of the present analysis, issues relating to the rights of coastal states to proclaim an exclusive economic zone and explore and exploit the natural resources found in their continental shelves and in the seabeds and subsoil of their exclusive economic zones are mostly relevant in light of the significant discoveries of hydrocarbons that have been made in the relevant zones of coastal states in the Eastern Mediterranean. Egypt was the first country in the region to enter the energy sector. The country is the largest non-OPEC oil producer in Africa and the second largest producer of natural gas on the continent. In 2012, <coughs> Egypt produced 722,000 barrels per day, per day of petroleum and in 2011, 2,163 billion cubic feet of natural gas. Due to major recent discoveries, natural gas is likely to be the primary growth engine of Egypt's energy sector. The oil and gas fields are located in the Nile Delta, the Western Desert and the Mediterranean Sea. In 1977, Egypt operated the Suez Mediterranean pipeline connecting essentially the Persian Gulf region to the Mediterranean. Israel, which has signed an agreement on maritime boundary delimitation with EEZ together with Cyprus in 2010, based on the median line, has seen a radical boost in energy exploration over the past years. According to estimates in January 2013, Israel's proved reserves of oil are 12 million barrels and its natural gas reserves at 9.5 trillion cubic feet. Located in the EZ of the country, its main natural gas wells are the Marie B, Tamar, Leviathan, Tanin, Dolphin, Dalit, Noah, Pinnacles and Carriage. The latest discovery in the Carriage 1 field off the coast of Haifa could hold between 80 billion and 100 billion cubic meters of natural gas. The biggest discovery, however, was made in the Leviathan field, located approximately 80 miles west of the coast of Haifa and situated in water that is more than 5,000 feet deep. Initial indicators showed that the arena could be as much as 17 trillion cubic feet of recoverable natural gas, but the consortium operating the field raised on 1st of May 2013 the field's estimated reserves to 18.9 trillion cubic feet. Cyprus entered the energy race in the Mediterranean last. It opened the first round of licensing from February to August 2007, granting an exploration license for block number 12 in its EZ, Aphrodite plots, to Noble Energy International Limited, 
on 24th of October 2008. The first natural gas discovery was made in December 2011 when Nobel announced that the field contains 7 trillion cubic feet of recoverable natural gas resources. A second licensing round opened in 2012 and further exploration is estimated to begin in the near future. More than Nobel, which operates in Block 12 and was awarded the license in the first licensing round, the energy giants Total for Blocks 12 and 11, Cogas and Eni Blocks 2, 3 and 9 have secured preliminary licenses in the second licensing round. Ladies and gentlemen, bearing in mind the above imperative parameters relating to issues dealing with the regime of the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf, it is deemed necessary to conclude this analysis by providing for the legal framework of rights, duties and responsibilities of coastal states and third states in the maritime zones under examination. The exclusive economic zone is a sui generis zone which combines characteristics of the territorial sea and the high seas but cannot be assimilated to either of them. In contrast to the continental shelf, which is the natural prolongation of land into the outer edge of the continental margin or to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baselines, and which is inherently vested in coastal states, the EEZ is a claimable zone the breadth of which cannot extend beyond 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. The rights, jurisdiction and duties of the coastal states in the exclusive economic zones are provided in Article 56 of the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and are divided into sovereign and jurisdictional rights. As regards the first set of rights, the coastal state has sovereign rights for exploring and exploiting, conserving and managing the natural resources, whether living or non-living, of the sea, seabed and subsoil. Coastal states could also explore and exploit the zone for other activities such as production of energy from the water, currents and winds. The second set of rights provides for the coastal state jurisdiction to establish and use of artificial islands, installations and structures, conduct marine scientific research and protect and preserve the marine environment. As part of the sovereign right of a coastal state to explore, exploit, conserve and manage the living resources in its exclusive economic zone, the state can exercise jurisdiction over vessels and their crews, including boarding, inspection, arrest and judicial proceedings, for the purposes of ensuring compliance with the laws and regulations adopted by it in conformity with the Convention. It is clear from the above that the coastal states in the Eastern Mediterranean who have proclaimed an EEZ were legally doing so and have also legally proceeded to exploration and exploitation of hydrocarbons in the areas falling within their respective exclusive economic zones. The Convention notably holds that the basis for the resolution of conflicts regarding the attribution of rights and jurisdiction in the exclusive economic zone is equity, which forms a general principle of law recognized by all civilized legal systems. 
It also provides that in cases that an agreement in relation to the delimitation of the EEZ cannot be reached within a reasonable period of time, the state's concern shall resort to specific measures set out in Part 15 of the 1982 Convention. The settlement of disputes should be accorded by peaceful means in accordance with Article 2, Paragraph 3 of the UN Charter. In that way, any disputes in relation to the EEZ as those existing in the Eastern Mediterranean should be resolved in the prescribed way, which in the case of the region, and since two of the states concerned are not part to the Convention, although bound by its provisions that became part of customary international law, is binding upon all, as all states concerned are members to the United Nations. Issues of military security in the EEZ and the continental shelf are vague under the Convention. Despite the fact that the Convention does not expressly authorize military activities in the EEZ, neither does it prohibit them. Nevertheless, a closer reading of Article 58, Paragraph 3 indicates that foreign states must have due regard to the rights and duties of coastal states and other states and shall comply with rules of international law. It seems, therefore, that the legitimate uses to which the EEZ regime may be put are to be determined by reference to general international law, which will prohibit any activities contrary to the purposes and principle of the United Nations, as noted in Articles 1 and 2 of the UN Charter. Dear fellows, the idiosyncrasies pertinent to the Eastern Mediterranean region are abundant. The different characteristics found in each of the countries involved have a common parameter. The prospects that come together with the outstanding discoveries of hydrocarbons in the region. It is in those lines that setting aside the differences and working together, nations across the world in general and across the Eastern Mediterranean in particular should reach amicable solutions to any pending disputes on the basis of international law and the laws relating to the sea. There has to be made a move, a significant one, an enormous step towards establishing the regional energy reserves into the world energy market. Immediate partners in that effort include the European Union, within which Cyprus can act as the uniting bridge between the three continents that surround the Eastern Mediterranean. Importantly, the transition from old multiculturalism based on the colonial reminiscences that are scattered around the region, whatever those might be, the shift from clientelism and loneliness should take the form of a new era of energy multiculturalism based on the common heritage of natural resources found in the region. An urgent step that needs to take place immediately in line with the above is to bridge Israel, Cyprus and Greece in a horizontal line which will allow in the future interception by a vertical line connecting Egypt and Cyprus. In that sense, the prospects, opportunities and projections will materialize, allowing connections to the European, African and Asian markets and profiting the countries involved. The greater picture will include the remaining 
Eastern Mediterranean countries, but that depends on their determination to establish better relations and find solutions in pressing issues that have been dominating their affairs with the rest individually and collectively in the past and at present. The new multicultural, energy-oriented Eastern Mediterranean will thus have the qualities of overcoming the difficulties and becoming a major player in international affairs. It is true, however, that the prospect of drawing the bigger picture is at least blurred at this stage, based on the geopolitical situation in the region. Still, the first step linking Israel to Cyprus and from there further is about to be made.